Hi everyone, welcome to the Landscape Photography Show. Sorry we're late, uh, have a few uh, gremlins today. So, uh, glad. I, hopefully everyone out there uh, was able to browse the web and have a little fun learning about photography while we were uh, getting the show started. But we got a great show for you tonight and uh, we have another problem. This is a couple guests in a row that uh, they're video camera doesn't seem to work so we can't see Jeff Sullivan's face there but he's able to share his screen and talk us through his presentation so uh, we'll be able to go ahead and go forward so um, just your introduction my name is Kevin Rowe and I live in South Jordan Utah and uh, I love uh, to shoot landscapes and I'm in Google Plus I'm a moderator in the landscape photography community and then uh, I also work in the landscape photography theme and uh, Tom will you introduce yourself? Sure, I'm Tom Verl and I live in Carmel, California. I'm also a, a curator on the landscape photography theme and as well as participate with the show and love to do landscape photography. Yeah, great Tom. And Margaret? Hi everybody, I'm Margaret Tompkins. I'm uh, retired, uh, living in Kansas City, Missouri, and to, uh, like the others here, thoroughly enjoy landscape photography. And I work in the um, landscape photography theme and also am a co-owner of the landscape photography community. So that's where we all seem to reside. Looking forward to tonight's show and night photography. All right, great. Jim? Hi, I'm Jim Worthman, um, amateur photographer based in Phoenix, Arizona, and uh, I love landscape photography, uh, color and black and white. On Google Plus, besides the landscape photography show, I participate in the landscape photography theme and the community. So there's a, there's a recurring theme here, and, and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing Jeff tonight. Should be a great show. Yeah, and uh, an interesting thing about Jim is he's he's a longtime member of several uh, photography clubs, and he does quite a bit of uh, judging from what I'm hearing now. So he's uh, uh, very knowledgeable in photography. Thanks, Joe. You bet. What we're going to do is uh, go to our show starter. So for those that don't know, this is the portion on our show where we go and each of us pick a photo that was out of the ones that were submitted to our event. And so if you want to be considered for that, just watch our, for our next event and uh, you can submit up to five photos and we might choose yours to uh, share at the beginning. So here is the one that I chose and this is Jason Fry. And I have a special uh, place in my heart for Jackson Hole and the Tetons uh, where I grew up was about two hours away from there and I've slept under these stars a lot of times and this is just a beautiful shot uh, really smooth water and a beautiful Milky Way so great job Jason gorgeous and Tom yes uh, I picked this one it's a uh, Renee Kesselbach this is um, the from uh, Australia, and uh, I really like the way uh, the reflections in the water and the, the fountains showed up, um, the detail here, um, stars and all the lights, so I thought this was very unusual, so I chose this as my show starter. Yeah, very cool. Margaret. Uh, this is one uh, from Craig Loxley, um, another Australian photographer. I had actually seen this photograph uh, before when he had posted it and it just really blew me away. I love the gorgeous lights and the wonderful reflections and and, and I love the composition here. You've got that wonderful um, cruise liner which I believe is the Queen Elizabeth. Uh, not sure if it's one or two but it's you know one of the big ones and then you've got those old schooners there, the sailing ships. So there's just quite a contrast in in, in the type of things that you're seeing there in the harbor, but just a beautiful, uh, beautiful photograph. Awesome. Thanks, Margaret. Jim. Yeah, this is from Christian Rogers, uh, not an Australian photographer. I think he's <laughs> from Idaho. Uh, I just love this composition. Um, 
you know, the focus, of course, is on the bright Milky Way. There's a lot of wonderful detail when you can view it large on your screen. Um, but I, I really like the stairway that kind of leads your eye up to the Milky Way. Um, I thought the exposure was real good in the lighting. It wasn't overly distracting. The, the foreground is, I thought, well lit, um, enough to give context to the Milky Way. And uh, what was interesting is he called this a stairway to heaven, and uh, that kind of tells its own story. So overall, a great photo, and I thank Christian for that. Yeah, and I absolutely love this one. This is such an awesome shot and yeah Christians in Idaho I always I always pay attention to people that are from Idaho cuz uh, that's where I'm originally from so me and then Jeff here's the one you chose <clears throat> I picked this one from Mike Taylor uh, I really like the way that he blended both star trails and a static shot of the uh, Milky Way uh, really kind of opens up the imagination for uh, the Milky Way passing through that area but catching a piece of it uh, in its uh, star trail sequence as it's uh, cycling through. So um, it's a real intriguing idea. And uh, I've, I've done things like that before, but I didn't do quite as much masking to uh, leave the Milky Way quite so clear. So it, it gives me some ideas for uh, things I might want to try in the future. Yeah. Really nice. Beautiful. Really cool shot. And Mike had uh, several really good shots in the in the group so absolutely uh, great night photographer so uh, again everyone thanks for uh, sharing those photos with us and uh, we'll come down here and uh, I'm gonna go over to Jim and Jim will get us started with our show sure we'll give uh, just a quick introduction to Jeff and those of you who have been longtime viewers of the show have seen Jeff before he's He's been a special guest several times on, on the show, and uh, he's a, a California-based photographer, does spectacular night shots. Um, he also leads workshops. He writes books. Um, just, just a great, great photographer, and uh, I guess rather than talk anymore, I'm going to hand it over to Jeff, and unfortunately, we can't see him, but we can see his photos. Uh, yeah, I'm in night mode. I'm invisible. <laughs> I uh, Technically, I actually have escaped California. I'm about uh, 100 feet or 100 yards, a uh, couple of lots into Nevada. Uh, <laughs> moved there in 2010 to be uh, closer to the eastern, in this eastern Sierra, closer to Mono Lake and Bodie and some of the other places that are my favorite places to shoot. So uh, my commute has gotten a lot shorter to my work, so I'm, I'm really enjoying it here. It's good. So uh, without further ado, I might as well uh, go into the material that I wanted to cover tonight. Uh, we had covered in the past in the previous shows uh, how to do uh, star trail shots, how to do Milky Way shots from a camera exposure technical standpoint with a little bit of post-processing. And we talked a little bit about doing uh, time lapse as well. What I want to cover, and then we also, in another one, did uh, the photo pill software and the planning for moon shots. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people are, are really liking uh, night photography these days. And they, now that they maybe have some of the basic uh, technique and exposure information down, the question comes down to, uh, what is it that, how do you plan for Milky Way shots? How do you know when the Milky Way will be there, when the lighting's right, when the position is right, has to be over the horizon? Maybe you even want to pick a specific uh, composition. So if we can pick, uh, there we go. Can you see my, uh, my blog post there? Yes. In the main screen? Yeah. Okay, good. So the, here's an example that I took in uh, mid-June and it's pretty early on in the night. By the end of May, early June, uh, by the time it gets dark enough to get a really good Milky Way shot, uh, that's, that, that time is referred to as astronomical twilight, or the end of astronomical twilight. Twilight being that in-between period between when it's uh, daylight and night. Uh, astronomical twilight, there, there are several different kinds of twilight. Uh, there's one that's a nautical for uh, navigation of boats. There's one that's civil, and then this one is astronomical. It's when it, the sky gets dark enough to 
look at uh, uh, astronomical targets like the Milky Way. So it's a pretty reliable indicator of when you'll get a really good Milky Way shot. And uh, when I'm shooting at night and the, the dawn is approaching, I can tell when astronomical twilight is within a few minutes because the sky starts to get a little bit brighter and you notice it and you're pretty much done shooting the Milky Way at that point. Um, so this would be, uh, this is shortly after the Milky Way rose to the east-southeast. The picture is at Mono Lake. Uh, and that, that time when it gets really easy to shoot the Milky Way right after dark and right after astronomical twilight starts right in that kind of early to mid-June time frame. Uh, but you can shoot it for many, many months. Um, as you look at the Milky Way, we're a giant spiral disk, and if you look at it from the side, we look a little bit, the Milky Way looks a little bit like you would think a flying saucer looks. It's a a flattish saucer with a fat part in the middle where the center of the Milky Way is. Uh, we're located in one of the spiral arms uh, part way out. So if you look in one direction towards the, the outside of the Milky Way, you don't get a lot of stars and it's, it's pretty thin and it's not as bright. But if you look towards that galactic center of the Milky Way, uh, there's a lot more uh, mass there, a lot more stars, a lot more light. And that's really the best thing for us to train our uh, cameras on. And you can see that in this uh, Mono Lake shot, the, the brightest area, a uh, little bit right of center, uh, that's where the galactic center is. And that's, that's a good thing to, uh, to have in your pictures. It's brighter, it has some contrast, some detail, um, and it provides a, a, a good point of focus. So, um, the way you can anticipate where the Milky Way will be at what times on what days, uh, first of all, the best nights are when there obviously isn't a lot of moon to interfere. So the days on either side of the new moon, when the moon is close to the sun and not visible in the night sky, uh, are the best times. But you can also uh, see exactly where the Milky Way is going to be and what a position, its position is going to be in the months prior to June, uh, the Milky Way doesn't necessarily rise right at uh, the end of astronomical twilight. You have to wait a few hours. Uh, like right now, uh, let's see, I'm trying to remember when I saw it last night. I think it was pretty much up by about midnight, maybe 11.30, or it was coming up then. Um, and basically as the seasons progress, the constellations in the sky and the Milky Way get back to their same position one year from where they started. So you're basically, and it changes a little bit each week and each month, uh, but for it to change 24 hours, basically back to that same time in 12 months, you basically change two hours a month. So if we know that the Milky Way is coming up, let's call it just to be for even numbers, uh, midnight right now, we know that a month from now, four weeks from now, it'll come up around 10 o'clock. And that's about when astronomical twilight is, uh, right at the beginning of June. So that's, uh, let's see, we're almost to May. So that's just about right. So actually we're about five weeks away. Uh, it's probably like 12.30 now <laughs> when the Milky Way comes up. So you don't have to do all that math. You don't have to, to go see it and then calculate how many weeks away you want to see it next or the next new moon is. Uh, you can actually use a, an app, a smartphone app called Starwalk. And there's several apps like this that are for viewing uh, a, an animated view of the sky, including the Milky Way and all the constellations and so forth. And uh, you can bring that up on your phone, and then you can change the date and time and even the place, so you will get exactly the sky view, uh, more or less exactly, that, that you would have uh, in that place and time um, that you've picked. So here's an example. This first one has um, Scorpius, and the horizon is right down here. And this is looking, uh, here's south right here, so east is off to the left here. And so right around the southeast is where uh, the galactic center tends to rise. And this was just last week during the uh, lunar eclipse, 
and it was on uh, April 15th, so it was the early morning on Tuesday when the eclipse was happening, and I put it more or less near the center of the eclipse. It was 12.45. I think where I was, the center of the eclipse was 12.48. But I wanted to know if the Milky Way would be up when the sky got dark. It was in the sky uh, if I had had a zero degree, a very low uh, horizon, but I was down in Yosemite Valley, so the walls of the valley were blocking the view of the Milky Way. So uh, at this point during the eclipse, uh, actually some clouds moved in, so I, I pretty much stopped shooting uh, shortly after this. But in theory, I, I had planned ahead that if I had put myself in a high uh, viewing position where I had essentially a zero degree horizon or close to it, uh, without mountains and a lot of trees and buildings in the way, I would have been able to see the Milky Way just above the horizon. And I thought that would be kind of cool to have a red sky from the red moon and yet still have the Milky Way in it. But uh, not this time. <laughs> so maybe next time. So the next, as I look forward, uh, my next um, milestone when I'm going to definitely be out shooting and need to know all this information is coming up on uh, May 5th, or I'm sorry, May 3rd. I'm going to do a Bodhi workshop, so I needed to know when uh, the Milky Way would come up behind Bodhi Butte. And again, here it is. Now we see east. South is just a little bit off the screen to the right. Here's the uh, center of the Milky Way coming up to the southeast. And uh, it follows this path right here. This is the ecliptic where uh, all the planets uh, basically travel that path, the sun and the moon, and uh, the Milky Way will follow that direction too, rising in the sky. So I can see on uh, May 3rd that for the Milky Way to be this much above the horizon, it's about 11.30. So my workshop's going to go till 1 o'clock, so we'll have roughly hour, hour and a half at the end with Milky Way. Prior to that, we'll have a crescent moon, so we'll have a little bit of illumination on the town. We'll do light painting and star trails. So we'll get a little bit of everything. So fast forward about three weeks from there to uh, May 24th. That's getting near the uh, new moon time <clears throat> for May. I think it's May 28th, so it's within about three or four days. Um, yes? Just a Quick question. Now, these these uh, screenshots that you're showing, are they screenshots from the PhotoWalk app? Uh, the app is called StarWalk. Oh, StarWalk, sorry. And uh, I have a link to it in my uh, blog post, and I can post the blog post to the uh, to the Hangout, a link to it. It's also at the top of my uh, photo stream. Uh, my stream, I've got a link to the blog post that, that I'm going through right now. Right. It's on my blogger blog. Yeah, we'll get that link in the show notes for everyone. I just yep. wanted to make sure that that was the, the app you were showing us. Go ahead. Yes, these are direct screenshots right off my uh, cell phone, basically. Awesome. And, and these apps tend to run on tablets as well, so if you don't want to uh, 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 squint your eyes, you can get a you know bigger tablet and, <laughs> or a bigger phone <laughs> and uh, do, do it that way. So, uh, so basically, I'll be back out... Uh, I'm, I'm going to be towards the end of the new moon cycle for the, the May 3rd one coming up in two weeks, and then I'll be near at the beginning of it about three or four days before the new moon uh, on the 24th on Memorial Day weekend. So again, I looked it up. This time, instead of uh, 11.30, I have roughly the same Milky Way position, but now it's 10 o'clock or an hour and a half earlier because, again, as I had said, it the, it changes about two hours per month, but this is about three weeks, so it's an hour and a half. So it's kind of working out just like uh, you would expect. So on that one, let's see, 10 o'clock, uh, we leave at 1. We'll have three hours of Milky Way shooting for that one. And for that one, we it's, it's close enough to the new moon that there is no moon while we're there, so we're just going to have a lot of uh, dark sky Milky Way shooting. Uh, once twilight is over. So during twilight we'll do uh, light painting and things like that. We'll still do light painting uh, after the Milky Way is up, but the Milky Way itself will be uh, a lot of the focus for this for the background sky. And then uh, skipping forward about another month into June, uh, what changes there is twilight is still uh, after 10 o'clock. It actually moves to 1018 for the end of astronomical twilight near the end of June, 
you're right within a few days. This one is June 26, so you're within about five days of the summer solstice. Longest days of the year, sun sets as late as possible, and uh, it doesn't get dark until about the latest uh, in the year. So 1018 is the end of twilight then, but the Milky Way did come up earlier during twilight, or even a little bit before. So what we have is that the Milky Way starts in a different position at the end of twilight. It's, you can see it's at a steeper angle here, and as the night progresses, it's also more to the south, because the Milky Way goes across the sky from where it rose to the southeast to where it's going to set more or less to the southwest, and so it's starting further along that path at, by the end of June. It's already pretty steeply tilted, uh, and it's to the south, and it's going to move from south to southwest as you're shooting for a few hours. Um, so you can also set the phone to say, well, what about at uh, morning astronomical twilight when I'm absolutely done shooting the Milky Way? If I want to shoot for four or five hours, what position is the Milky Way going to be in then? And you can really plan uh, different compositions uh, by the position that the Milky Way is going to be in, the direction it's going to be in. You can look on Google Earth and line things up, or a program like the Photographer's Ephemeris, line things up on a satellite photo, and uh, really do a lot of even compositional planning ahead of time uh, to get the kind of shot you want. So if we do the same kind of, uh, just skip forward yet another month or two, here we get into July. Again, it's starting at a pretty steep angle. It's even further uh, just to the right of south. And then we get to August. And uh, by 10 o'clock on August 30th, that's um, Labor Day weekend, uh, the Milky Way is already past vertical. It's well past south. It's actually to the southwest. And this is as soon as it gets dark to start shooting. And it's actually on a downward uh, setting trend, so the center of the Milky Way won't be up very long. It's actually setting by the time you get to uh, a little bit after 10 o'clock by the end of uh, August. Now you'll still have the rest of the Milky Way. There's still a lot going on just above that, uh, but the brightest of the Milky Way, you better be ready to get it at 10 o'clock because by 11 or 12, it's already starting to set. So okay. you can see. <clears throat> so I guess in general, the, the time when you, if you want to get it fairly flat across the sky or at a low angle, you probably want to be in June uh, or even in May where you wait till it comes up at whatever it is, midnight or whatever. Uh, then if you want it a little bit tilted, uh, a little bit later in the night in June or into July is good. If you want it vertical, uh, July and August will be when it's uh, pretty convenient right after uh, it's gotten dark enough to shoot. So Jeff, just a, a quick question, and this is just my own question. So I've typically, uh, you know, by the time I get out to try and shoot uh, the Milky Way around here, um, it's usually late in the summer, and I have a heck of an issue with it being dark enough to catch it. So you, you think that's the, the issue, is that's just yep. too late in the summer to, to get that? Before it's, because uh, it seems to be gone before yeah. it's dark. You there, Jeff? We lost you. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you're Jeff, your audio is kind of coming and going. Are you there? Yeah, now we can hear you. Okay. Uh, there you I'll, go. Just, I'll keep talking. Yep, there Tell we are. It's working. <laughs> is that better? Okay. okay so, uh, let me try to close another window or two here just in case. Even a low hill or some trees or a building, uh, if you're not at a pretty high elevation, this uh, end of August, and it has to be in this direction too, looking southwest, 
you need a low horizon to sh to shoot the Milky Way and and have it be bright in late August. Mm -hmm. So I would say if there's any way you can pull it off, try to shoot more. Uh... Oh, we just lost Jeff. So we did. This is uh, some of our technical difficulties tonight. So. Um... <laughs> Looks like he's getting back on here. Oh, I'm here. Wow, well, that was that was good. It, it automatically reconnected. <laughs> oh, well, that's weird. Okay, we'll give yeah. a minute to get your screen share back up. But yeah, I, I think we heard the the gist of my question I had there. So I think we got and, that. Appreciate and it. I, while we're while Jeff is getting set back up, I I'll add that that uh, there are a number of you know mobile device based astronomy or planetarium apps um, yep. and and some of them are kind of neat because you can you can tell it to to step through time and you can set the step size to you know like one day or one hour or one minute if you set it to a day and then just press play it'll actually show the Milky Way rising and and as it changes relative to the horizon over time so you can say well what's it going to look like from May through August, and and you can kind of gauge when's going to be the best time for your location. Good. Yep. Yeah, Starwalk does that. They probably all have similar functions. Yep. And you're you're back up. Go ahead. Uh oh. Uh, I just lost the screen. Hold on. Oh, that's strange. But we see it. Oh, there you are. Okay, got you back. Okay, good. <laughs> that was kind of scary. <laughs> I do have a. Why we're why we're in this pause? I there is a uh, viewer question here. Let me uh, ask you that. So they're asking: Is it possible to take Milky Way photos from a place which is polluted with light? It is possible, but the light pollution does uh, diminish the contrast between the Milky Way stars and the background, which you want to be as dark as possible. So it effectively kind of washes it out a little bit. But often when you're near cities, not maybe not necessarily right in one, but you're near one and you have a little bit of light pollution, uh, you can see it, it's just not as intense as it would be if you got further away from the cities. Um, and, and the cities are not all equal either. Uh, some cities, uh, you can just stick a hill between you and them and you do pretty well. Uh, other ones, like Las Vegas, you want to be as far away from as possible. <laughs> uh, that, that's got some serious light pollution. <laughs> yeah, Las Vegas really uh, celebrates uh, lights, and uh, it's a tough one to get around. Yeah. And Jeff, I, I think there are websites that show relative light pollution all around the country, so if you're looking for a place to go that's really dark, you can perhaps use some of these uh, websites to help guide you. Absolutely. There's a organization called the International Dark Sky Association, or IDA, and uh, they have uh, light pollution maps, and they even have an app that, in theory, you should be able to point your, sky, your, your phone mm -hmm. skyward, have it record the light level, and uh, then it will uh, use that, put it into a database, and start to calculate what the actual... Uh, light kind of base light pollution levels are uh, in various areas. I downloaded the light pollution. I like it. Yeah. I I haven't been able to get the app to work on my phone, but um, but it's a great concept, and and I do like the maps they have. Uh, they actually uh, spend a lot of time and effort encouraging uh, cities to to adopt lighting ordinances that uh, that change over the street lights to have uh, cowls covering them so it only points the light down at the ground where you want it and isn't leaking out sideways into space uh, for street lights and those utility lights and they try to encourage people to to get fixtures that do the same so there's less stray light uh, mm -hmm. flying all over the place 
and they've had some success with places like Anza Brego State Park, uh, the town of Brego Springs in California. Uh, they will certify certain areas as dark sky reserves. Often it's um, national parks and so forth that already don't have a lot of lights already, but they're, they want to highlight that they do have very dark skies. Uh, Death Valley, I think, is one of those places. In Death Valley, it's kind of hit or miss. You, you just want to not have a real direct view towards Las Vegas. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, we uh, yeah. We had another Go question ahead. here on the event. How does latitude affect the position and orientation of the Milky Way, say up at Mount Rainier versus Mono Lake latitudes? Right. It, it will affect it. It will be lower in the sky, so actually that will also contract that time period in the summer when it gets high enough and, and really high. Uh, so instead of, say, <clears throat> late May to mid to late August, you probably want to be closer to the summer solstice and, and try to really be in June or July, maybe even the, f the first three quarters of July. And it won't get quite as high in the sky because you're at a higher latitude and the, the Milky Way, the center of it, uh, doesn't get terribly high, uh, but it will be there, and especially if you're within, say, three or four weeks of the summer solstice, it should be pretty good. And again, you can pay attention to um, what your surroundings are, too. If you're high up on the mountain in some of those viewpoints and you have a nice southward view that isn't obstructed, it'll be better than if you're, say, down in a little valley or in a, even by a lake where the, uh, the hills around you are cutting off some of your uh, kind of southeast to southwest view where the Milky Way is going to be moving. So that's a good point. You definitely will lose a little bit, and at some point when you get far enough north up towards the Arctic Circle, you might not see it at all, but, uh, but for most of us in the mid-latitudes, we can do pretty well, especially in those summer weeks and months. And Jeff, a, a program like Starwalk lets you tell it your location, right? So it's tailoring the view of the sky to where you are. Absolutely. You can uh, either have it say use current location or you can search for a, a city or landmark and uh, it will do all the calculations from that point and it will show you the sky. So like when I'm planning a trip to Death Valley, I'll do that. I'll, I'll have it uh, pick a different location than I'm in and then I'll, I'll do my planning based on that. And that does help quite a bit. Yeah, I think it's important to use these tools because you, um, you know, if you're heading to an amazing place and are expecting to do night photography and there's nothing to shoot, then you're gonna be you're gonna be disappointed. Yeah, it really helps you allocate your time too, because if you're doing it in say May and the Milky Way isn't gonna come up until 11:30. Uh, you know that you can go do something else. You go do light painting of, you know, I often light paint uh, old cars or buildings or whatever. You just do that till the Milky Way comes up, and then you know the Milky Way is going to come up. You get that done, and then you go to bed. <laughs> Actually get some sleep. So what I'll often do is um, once the Milky Way comes up, once you've shot it a few times, you know how your camera is going to do and what settings you want for the uh, exposure. You can set it up put an interval timer on it, an intervalometer, and uh, just leave it shooting until the batteries run down. And I even put a dual battery pack in, so on my 5D Mark III, I can get about six hours of shooting, uh, and I just have a nice clean card in there, and I'll get several hundred photos as the Milky Way moves across the sky. And one cool thing about that is you often then pick up a few uh, satellites and meteors, and uh, so you can pick the one shot out of several hundred that has a big uh, red, white, and green uh, meteor streaking across it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it really opens up some options, and, and it lets you get a little more sleep even though you're doing night shooting. <laughs> so let's see. Uh, while we're... I think one, one thing I'll, I'll cover here, too, is uh, switch the, sc the uh, screens here real quick. Okay. Uh, another thing that's coming up this time of year, in addition to our nice summer Milky Ways, 
is uh, moon bows. And here in California, for example, we have a, a pretty good runoff season in the spring, and our snow melt is coming down, creating some nice waterfalls. And uh, the process of having a rainbow at night or moon bow is pretty much the same as the way it happens during the day. The, the light from the sun, or in this uh, uh, refracted, so it separates the light into uh, the rainbow colors. So essentially what you do is you find your rainbow with a a lot of spray, you put the moon at your back, and you maybe move your position around until you see a rainbow. And you do this on a full moon night, so this different waterfalls, even small ones, uh, just by moving your camera around, taking a test shot until you uh, uh, you get the, the, the colors. So this is... Uh, from Cook's Meadow in Yosemite, it's uh, right at the top of Lower Yosemite Falls. And uh, I, I zoomed in pretty good for this one, probably about 100 millimeters. Beautiful. Yeah. And then you can even get reflections. This is in a, this, unfortunately, this pond isn't big this, this big this year. I was just there last week looking for moon bows, and this shot wasn't available. And the spray wasn't quite as good either. It wasn't, uh, uh, as much to pick up the rainbow here in Upper Yosemite Falls. But you can see there are lots of different things you can do. Um, oh, I just lost him again. <laughs> He's back. I think... Uh, wow, it reconnected again. I'm really impressed. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's good, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, Tom, you, you have some uh, moon bow pictures at Yosemite, don't you? Yes, that's right. There, there's actually a, a website that some professors in Texas put together where they predict the uh, the best nights to go and, you know, where everything's lined up correctly. And I'll have to put the link to that in the, in the show notes. Yeah, cool. Yeah, that's uh, Don Olson at the University of Texas. Yeah, exactly. And uh, he's a great resource. He, he pretty much pre-calculates two different shooting positions, one from Cook Meadow for uh, Upper Yosemite Falls, similar to this shot, and then the one that I showed at first with the double moon bow uh, right from a bridge below Lower Yosemite Fall. Um, and that's coming up in mid-May, May 12th through 15th. And uh, I'll probably go over there and... and see how the moon bows are doing. <laughs> they were a little bit uh, on the light side when I went there last week. I'm hoping that there'll be a little bit more runoff next month when I go. Mm -hmm. Well, make sure you share them with us in landscape photography and we can feature those. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Absolutely. Gorgeous. Yep. And then, uh, let's see, other things you can do, you can try to get uh, reflections of the Milky Way. That's actually really tough, because to get the Milky Way well exposed, you're kind of pushing the limits of what your camera can do. Mm -hmm. uh, on my Canon, I like to use ISO 6400, f2.8 lenses, and shoot for 30 seconds. If you shoot much more than 30 seconds, you start to get the stars dragging, and that's this is with a 16-millimeter uh, lens, so it's ultra-wide, and that reduces the amount of movement that the stars have. Um, but I don't want to go much over ISO 6400 because I start to get a lot of noise. And uh, a lot of my lenses, my ultra-wide lenses, don't go wider than 2.8. So I'm kind of stuck against all those barriers. To get a reflection, though, a reflection is, as you probably know from daytime shooting, you often use a graduated neutral density filter to even out the reflected view, which is darker, with the direct view, which is going to be about two to three stops usually uh, brighter. So in theory, to get the reflection of the Milky Way well, you'd need about three more stops. So instead of ISO 6400, you'd want to go to 12.8, then 25.6, and then 
50, what is it, 52, 53,200. <laughs> and uh, not too many cameras are shooting well at that these days. So what I, what I end up doing is I might push my Canon 5D Mark III to maybe 12,800, and then I just work like crazy in the post-processing to try to reduce the noise and, and try to fix it. A lot of people will do a Photoshop mirror. I don't, I, I'm not really into that, so I, I haven't really gone there yet. Uh, but that's another option. You could always just kind of take your sky and, and mirror it uh, down into the foreground. But uh, I, I just try to steer away from that myself. Jeff, do you yeah. have any rule of thumb for uh, how long the exposure can be as a function of the focal length. So if you have a longer uh, focal length, you know, if you're zoomed in more, usually that would be a shorter exposure. But do you have any any guidance for how to figure that out? Yeah, there are. there's something called the rule of 500 where you divide the focal length by 500 or something like that. But I just, I just use the app PhotoPills. It has some suggestions where you just look up uh, you know, you look up your focal length and it'll tell you, oh, well, if you want to do 24 millimeters, you want to do more, no more than 20 seconds, for example. And at 50 millimeters, it'll be something else, maybe 10 seconds. And it's just all in there. And they, they have, I think they have depth of field and they've got so many, so many different planning tools in that app. It just comes in really handy. Great idea. And then I also, for when all I want is depth of field, there's a there's an, a free app called Simple DOF, and uh, that's really handy too. Because when normally when you're thinking of depth of field, you're trying to maybe get a hyperfocal shot during the day and get as much depth of field as possible. But during the day, I mean, all your experience is with f16 and f11, and maybe you want to zoom in on flowers. You may want a shallow depth of field. You do f8. Uh, but that's not what you're shooting at at night. I mean, especially on these dark nights with the Milky Way, you're all f2.8 to 3.5 to 4.0, and, uh, and you're with your ultra-wide lenses, and, and all of a sudden you're kind of out of your element as far as what you have a ton of experience with. Because that's the other thing at night. You don't take that many shots. A day you could run around and get all these hundredth of a second shots as fast as you can shoot them, at night, your experience comes a little slower because it takes longer to set up the shot, to get it composed properly. You're shining lights on it to maybe focus. It may take five or ten minutes per shot. And, uh, and then the actual exposure, you might have a 30-second exposure, but you might want to try light painting something uh, three or four times to get it just right. So you're only getting a few shots an hour, and... Uh, if you're having to fumble around to figure out uh, how to get everything in focus uh, at you know that focal length at f2.8, uh, it's just going to take too much time and too much experimentation, and you're going to miss a lot of shots. So it's better to look it up in a program like Simple BOF and go, okay, for my 14 millimeter shot uh, lens at f2.8, here's what it is. For my 16 millimeter, here's what it is, and you find out that with those ultra wide lenses you actually get a surprising amount of depth of field even when you've pushed the aperture all the way open. Um, at 16 millimeters, for example, at f2.8, I think the hyperfocal distance is about 30 or 40 feet, if I remember correctly. So basically, you focus it at 30 or 40, and in theory, you should get from half that distance, or 20, uh, 15 or 20 feet, all the way to infinity, all the way to the stars in focus. Mm -hmm. So you actually have pretty good latitude since with an ultra-wide lens at night, usually your subject is 20 or 30 feet away anyway if it's like a car or a building, a small building. So you can just focus on the car or the building. It'll get half of your foreground and then all the way to the stars in focus. And it ends up being pretty simple, pretty straightforward. And you get, you know, most people would think, oh, no, i got to stop down the lens, get more depth of field. Man, eh, not really not with an ultra-wide lens. So uh, it actually is pretty cool that it, it works out so well. 
So I think I've covered most of uh, most of what I wanted to cover for the Milky Way. I mainly wanted to give people the tools to uh, plan and anticipate when it's going to come up, what the uh, you know what the angles would be, and uh, you know then you can plan to have the Milky Way go corner to corner in your picture or from your subject up to a corner, and uh, really makes things easy. I think it'll help people out quite a bit. Right. So are there any more questions? Um, did you see any questions, Jim? I don't think... Uh... Um, Richard Kramer had a follow-up question. Um, yeah. Thanks for answering the previous one, but then he wondered about uh, are there any filters for DSLRs that, that can be helpful in those cases where there are city lights that are narrow band like mercury or sodium lights where where it's it's narrow spectrum light you know and and those are common i know in astronomy where you know you can put specific filters on your telescope to block those kinds of narrow band lights but right uh, how about dslrs there probably are films often with the uh, the astronomy ones. It'll come in a film format so that you can, uh, and then you mount it in a ring that goes over the end of your telescope because, uh, you know, telescope uh, widths might be six inches, eight inches, whatever. They get pretty big, so you need to have a, a material that can be tailored to the uh, opening of the telescope. Uh, so what I've done for, for example, for solar photography is uh, one of the astronomical films is made by a company, Bader, and they, uh, I think it's called Solar, Bader, Solar, ah, shoot, I'm forgetting the name of it, but it's, it's Bader something solar, and it cuts your light so that you can actually point your camera directly at the sun. So for a solar eclipse or when Venus was going in front of the sun, I just cut a little square of that film. I got a, a big roll of it, and I, I cut a little square, taped it over the end of my 200-millimeter uh, lens, and uh, added a teleconverter to double it. Um, and so I was I was zooming right in on the sun and, and taking some uh, uh, telephoto shots. Yeah. So, <clears throat> so I know that it can be done. I, I haven't, since I'm not in those... Um, environments with those kinds of lights, I haven't looked up uh, those specific filters to block those uh, like sodium vapor lights and so forth. But right. as you said, I know they're available. You could look them up in an astronomy supply store online so and maybe, uh, probably find that sheet material. Yeah, that, and that's real good. I hadn't thought of getting the sheets. Maybe Richard can look that up and post it in the in the event. Uh, it's I just looked your your Bader film up. It's Astro Solar. And I've That's used it. Yes. There was the the eclipse uh, what about two summers ago? Um, yep. And, uh, and I ended up using it from that shooting it from up at Page. Yep. And right before the eclipse was the Venus transit, so you had both in the same week. It was pretty yep. cool. Let's see. I got I got one other question here, and yeah. it's in relation to. So it says, when exposed for the Milky Way, do the stars end up clipping, or is there a sweet spot? Uh, clipping in I'm terms of means clipping is in uh, highlights blowing out, which I. I'm no, sorry. I actually don't run into that. I don't run into situations. I may want to. Sometimes it's maybe slightly bright, so I may want to tone it down in post-processing. I should throw in the caveat. I shoot with a lot of people with different cameras at my workshops, and uh, it seems like the Nikons are a little brighter, so sometimes uh, some of the Nikons you might end up shooting at 3,200 or 4,000 or 5,000 instead of 6,400. But what you have to watch out with all of these is that when you, if you were to underexpose anything in the picture, not only the stars and the Milky Way in the sky, but your foreground doesn't have much light. It's, it's reflected starlight, so you have very, very little light. So you can have a lot of your, your signal, uh, your information that you want to see coming from the foreground 
is going to be very close to zero, very close to the noise level. So you tend to lose detail and lose information and um, end up with way too much noise. So what I'm trying to recommend to fix that is that you, if you're going to make an error, go towards overexposing a little bit. Now, it's not going to be blown out with blown highlights in most cases, unless you have a ton of light pollution around. It's just going to be a little brighter than you might want to end up with it to look like a really good night shot. But what I'm saying is that's a really good thing, because if you don't do that, you're going to have so much noise in your uh, foreground, you're going to think, or what a lot of people would automatically think is, oh, that's because I went to ISO 6400. No, it's not. It's, it's not because of that. It's because there's just so little light that those shadows are underexposed. So it's underexposure noise, not high ISO noise. Even though it comes from shooting, you know, while you happen to be shooting at high ISO, the reason is not just the high ISO. It's really just that you don't have enough light. And a digital camera is kind of odd that way. It's, it's not noise that's all over the whole picture. It will be noisier at higher ISOs but you're specifically getting the worst noise in the dark areas because it's just a signal-to-noise ratio thing. The, the signal coming off the chip uh, off each pixel is just not that much higher than the background noise uh, of the whole, the whole chip in electronics itself. So, uh, so I, what I would say is if you're going to do anything, err to the side of making it slightly bright, and then you can always... Uh, darken it in post-processing and that will make that noise go away because you won't have as much underexposure noise and as you darken things you see it even less and less so so that was a, a really good question yeah great question I and I, I know by m my experimentation that I you know I mean it's it's hard to get too much light when you're trying to shoot the lot Milky Way and you actually, yes. you actually bring out more than what you can see with your visible eye um, if you if you do it correctly, so it's it's a great thing. More lights, better. You're not going to overexpose it. And what you also find out too is that although most people think of night sky as being black and just really dark, what you find is that's true for about the first 15 or 20 minutes you go out there. Then once your eyes adjust, especially on a new moon night and you're out there for a long time, uh, your eyes you can actually walk around under the Milky Way with no moonlight or anything, you can usually see the ground, not if you're in a forest, because again, you just got too much uh, shadow and not enough light. But if you're in an open area, you can usually walk around and not trip over too much. And you can make out a lot of detail and even color in the sky. Um, and that comes out in your picture. So once you've learned to shoot with a higher ISO than you might think you need, uh, you tend to get a lot more color that's in the sky that is there that other people aren't getting just because they're underexposing. If you're shooting at, you know, a, a, a lower ISO and, a, and you stop, maybe you don't have a lens that goes to 2.8 or you stop it down to f4, uh, you'll still get a good night shot. You'll still see the Milky Way, but it'll be against black. And, you know, if you've, if you've tried shooting the other way, higher ISO, etc., you know you're just not getting the colors that are there. And like I said, it's a, it could be a stylistic thing, too. Maybe some people just prefer giving everyone what they expect, you know, black background sky, because that's all they see when, when they walk from their car into their house because their eyes never adjusted. But I'd rather, I'd rather get everything I can, personally. That's just my choice. I'd rather get everything I can and, and show it all. And, and sometimes you get uh, close to the horizon within about, say, maybe 20 to 30 degrees, you get a lot of green, and that is there. It's a lot like, um, a lot like the northern lights, but it's called air glow or sky glow. It's just a very low level that's all around the earth at times, of that same uh, luminosity and that same green color that you get with the northern lights. Uh, so it's kind of cool that you can that you can pick that up in just about any night shot. You don't have to necessarily go to uh, Norway or Alaska. <laughs> To, uh, to get that cool green color. And then when you do a time lapse, it actually moves, just like the uh, northern lights do. You get a little bit of movement in that, that green light uh, that's low to the horizon. So it's kind of cool. Great. Well, that sounds good. Uh, do you have anything else you need to go over, Jeff? Or? 
No, not necessarily, unless someone, you know, we have another uh, lunar eclipse coming up uh, in October. I could just very quickly cover uh, what I did last week for that. Um, why don't we save that for a different show? I think we're just about there out of go. time. So. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. maybe uh, as that date approaches, we yeah. can do that. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Sounds Great. good. All right, well, well we appreciate it. And just uh, one, there was one other question, and, and Jim answered it in the forum, but uh, someone is asking about accessing the earlier shows with Jeff, and I definitely recommend going and watching. He's done two previous shows, and I definitely recommend going back and watching those. You can get to those from the Landscape Photography uh, show page if you just click on the YouTube uh, link right underneath the banner, and then you can from there find all the videos so I definitely recommend checking those out you'll learn quite a bit if you're interested in night photography so uh, appreciate it Jeff and from here let's uh, go back over to Jim and let's do our recommended photographers sounds good okay um, so I'll start and this is Jessica Macro um, another Australian photographer uh, they're well represented here. Um, you know, she's not been on Google Plus all that long, maybe less than a year, and, and has about a thousand followers or so. Um, she has a, a pretty eclectic stream, um, a lot of her own work, and, and also she does a lot of reshares uh, from other Australian photographers in particular. Um, here's one uh, of her night shots that I thought was pretty striking. And uh, here's another example of, of one of her ocean scenes, and, and she's got a lot of those, you know, a lot of great color. She also has some macro and wildlife shots, so um, highly recommend you go uh, take a look at her stream and circle her. Hey, Margaret. Uh, my choice is Clark Little. Um, I actually have been following him for quite some time. I think when I was um, still working uh, in like 2011, someone had shared some of his photographs uh, with me. And now uh, he's in Hawaii. And um, he's known for his shore break uh, photography. So when you see these massive waves coming in and the surfers getting nailed, um, he's actually in the water taking pictures of this sort of thing. And just some incredible photographs uh, that you never can imagine. And I think this is one area of photography that probably most of us will not ever be able to capture uh, yeah. because we don't have the equipment or we can't swim or whatever. Uh, but uh, just incredible uh, photographs uh, that he has done. That was and one I've, of the coolest waves I've ever seen. Isn't yeah. it though? Um, and I've actually, I own some of his um, photography uh, that's done on metal which mm. is just incredible when you get this gorgeous water and um, it's got a metallic uh, look to it. He does a lot of the, the uh, Hano, or the turtles, uh, the Hawaiian green sea turtles, which are endangered. Uh, they'll be underwater and um, he does incredible photographs of them as well. So just an incredible uh, photographer uh, and, and does brilliant work. I just, um, it's, uh, he has calendars that he makes, and it's calendars like this that get us people that live in cold weather <laughs> just through the winter. That's right. So, <laughs> so he's kind of a lifesaver in that respect. So I dream of these wonderful warm waters and uh, the cool shots. So just brilliant work. So go follow Clark Little. It's inspiring stuff. Okay. Um. Um, my photographer this week is David Hoffman. He's a landscape and nature photographer from Mariposa, California. And because he lives in Mariposa, he's able to access Yosemite uh, very readily. So I have enjoyed the uh, past few months all his pictures from Yosemite. Um, this particular shot happens to be the um, Merced uh, River, I assume. And it's, it's probably uh, near sunrise. And you see the reflection of El Capitan in the water. But, you know, the... the subtle yellow and golden colors um, on the ice. I, I really like really like this shot in particular. And uh, if you go to the next shot, uh, this is a 
one he took after the, the valley received a dusting of snow, and I, I like the, the delicate uh, trees in the foreground, just contrasting with the uh, the granite from El Capitan in the, in the background. Um, really like this shot as well. So if you're not already following David, I'd recommend that you do follow him. He does great work. Awesome. Okay, and uh, Jeff, your choice. Okay, let me uh, get it up on the screen there. He's, he's already got it up for you, Jeff. You can just talk about it. It's oh, okay. Uh, oh, uh, for photographers, uh, yeah, Jason I had picked as, a, as one of the uh, original photos that uh, had been uh, submitted. I had actually picked three people uh, in case we had duplicates. <laughs> I okay. think this is one of the barns, yeah, Molten Barn in uh, near in Grand Teton National Park, yeah. and uh, I'm I'm always a sucker for a good Milky Way shot, so <laughs> so that resonated with me. Gorgeous, thank you. Yep, another one of those Jackson Hole. There's some amazing nights up there, night skies in in the Tetons. So definitely. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. And uh, now back to Kevin. Yeah, so this is uh, George Fletcher, and George is a, a huge contributor to the landscape photography theme, and so we like George a lot, and I uh, looked, and he wasn't in our recommended photographers. I think sometimes we, we uh, think that someone's already in there, and then we forget about them, so George probably should have been recommended a while ago, so here we are now, and here's a great... Uh, you know, since we're on the night photography show, I figured I'd pick one of his uh, night shots there. Uh, great foreground, and love the tree silhouette there uh, going up with the Milky Way. It's awesome. Yeah. And then uh, he has a really cool uh, black and white shot here. Just uh, great contrast, great clouds, and he does great work, so follow him. Beautiful. All right. Nice. Okay. All right, well, we had a great show. Um, if anyone has any other questions for Jeff, go ahead and post them in our in our show, and we'll we'll try and get you hooked up with Jeff. I also recommend that you go and, and follow Jeff if you're not already. Uh, he's got a lot of resources. Uh, follow his blog. I've went to his blog. It's great. And uh, we appreciate him coming on, and probably won't be the last time we have him. So... Coming up on uh, May 6th, our next show, we're going to do something new, and we're going to have a show that we're going to do some critiquing. So we're going to ask people to uh, submit photos that they wouldn't mind being critiqued, and uh, we're going to do some live examples right on the air of possibly post-processing uh, ideas that we might have, and uh, it should be a great and... Uh, good learning experience so mark your calendars for that and then uh, on May 20th we will have Jay Patel Jay and Verena Patel will both be on and they're going to be sharing some of their workflow and uh, if you don't know who Jay is then uh, just look it up here on Google Plus and he's a professional landscape photographer and uh, we look forward to those shows and we appreciate everyone hanging with us through our uh, late start tonight and we'll say good night. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Good night, everybody. Thanks, guys.